You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning from Washington, D.C. My name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East West Center and the Director of the East West Center in Washington. It gives me absolutely great pleasure and it's a privilege to welcome to today's program on science diplomacy, a crucible for turning the tide in the South China Sea, a number of distinguished panelists, presenters from around the region, and of course, the United States. I know many of you are joining us at different times uh, and uh, different parts of the day, and so I welcome you all, and thank you for accommodating this program in your very busy uh, schedules. Um, as I introduce the program, many of you are well aware of the South China Sea security, political, diplomatic, military issues. Uh, at least in the Washington DC environment, we spend a lot of time discussing those issues. But also at play, concurrently, simultaneously, are fundamental issues about ecology, about sustainability, about marine environments, about demands for populations, for food, for economic growth, for future sustainability. And those issues underlie other contested issues. And I'm so pleased to be able to have these distinguished folks uh, provide perspectives from their uh, own work, from their regional countries, um, as well as Americans on this program about some of those issues to inform a more holistic approach or a more holistic way of seeing the challenges that face us in all marine environments, but in today's case, focusing on the South China Sea. Another aspect of this, of course, is the discussion of these issues and cooperation on these issues as a mechanism or mode of diplomacy. And to kick us off, we have, as I speak from your program, you will note all of the speakers that will run concurrently in two panels over 90 minutes. But to sort of set the stage for the science diplomacy element of this, uh, it brings me great pleasure to invite uh, Professor Paul Arthur Berkman. As you know, he is um, a professor of practice in science diplomacy, and he's the founding director of the Science Diplomacy Center at the very uh, eminent Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Tufts University. Uh, he has done a number of uh, works, publications, which you will see uh, online um, where we've provided those details. Uh, as well as an associated fellow at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. So he is really bringing together science as well as diplomacy uh, together in his work and in his teaching and in his research. And he was telling us as we prepared for this program that he has been doing scuba diving in the Antarctic at two degrees below zero centigrade. So I, I don't envy him that. I sometimes uh, shudder to get into uh, outdoor pools when it's uh, 75. And so uh, I, I, he is a much, um, uh, I think, much tougher person on, the, on, on swimming than I am. But Professor Berkman, I welcome you. And then after your prepared remarks initially, we will go to panel one uh, comprising of uh, Dr. McManus and uh, Dr. Hoy. Please, please, Dr. Berkman. Thank you, Satu. Um, thank you, James, uh, for the invitation. Let me share my screen and, and begin the presentation. I've been tasked with uh, introducing science diplomacy. And for purposes of discussion, uh, we'll talk about science diplomacy and informed decision making in the South China Sea. Um, in a general sense, starting with the big picture, if we look at the Earth on a planetary scale, about 30% of the Earth falls within the boundaries of nations. Um, the rain, reigning part falls beyond the boundaries of nations uh, in areas that are established under international law as international spaces. And in a sense, the challenge we face as a globally interconnected civilization is one of balancing national interests and common interests. And this challenge is a forever challenge. And so what I'd like to uh, introduce in the context of the South China Sea is strategy, process, international, interdisciplinary, inclusive, holistic, to think about building common interests so that we as a civilization can balance national interests and common interests. 
four definitions since the discussion involves science diplomacy. Science diplomacy itself is a language of hope. And like any language, it has its own vocabulary, its own grammar in a sense, but it is a language of hope. Science diplomacy is an international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive process. Inclusive is by far the biggest challenge at local to global scales. These three elements, international, interdisciplinary, inclusive, in a sense, define the word holistic. The process itself involves informed decision-making. The purpose is to balance national interests and common interests for the benefit of all on earth across generations. It's all on earth, it's not just humans. We have responsibilities as stewards as well on a planetary scale. If we think about how we respond to our stewardship responsibility, in a sense, the observation is that there is a continuum of urgencies that we collectively, individually and collectively, have responsibility to address. For nations, peoples, and our world, that continuum extends from security timescales that relate to mitigating immediate risks of political, economic, societal, and environmental instabilities. Risks of instabilities are the fodder of any security dialogue. On the other end of the spectrum are sustainability timescales, which also are urgent, balancing societal, economic, and environmental considerations across generations. The challenge isn't one end of the spectrum or the other, it's the, to operate across that spectrum. This continuum of urgencies concept was initiated in dialogue with the Foreign Minister of Science and Technology Advisors in 2016 and has rapidly been evolving to the point where we now have theoretical framework associated with informed decisions, that an informed decision operates across a continuum of urgencies. In the context of this discussion, in the context of how peoples, nations, and our world interact, in effect, there is a constant process of negotiation the gloom and doom that we see in the world today is in part and in large because this discussion starts with position of conflict. Conflict resolution is the predominant negotiation strategy. At the time scale of generations and across the entire continuum, there also is a negotiation strategy of common interest building. And what I'd like to focus on is the notion of common interest building to achieve balance, not only on a planetary scale, but within regions like the South China Sea. This, this talk also, for example, was given in the Middle East to the directors of the diplomatic academies of the Arab nations. The Middle East is a similarly complicated region. If we think about informed decision-making and how it operates in the context of being practical, starts with questions. And questions is a, is a starting place for inquiry in any flamer beginning in early childhood. Questions that are of common interest, questions of common concern, reveal the methods, whether they're natural science or social science or indigenous knowledge, to generate the data to answer the questions. Questions and data are research. At the stage of being a researcher, we are observers. The observation is that data is different than evidence. Evidence involves institutions that make decisions. So evidence is for decisions, data is to answer questions. And so there's a data evidence interface. And once we begin to contribute to evidence, we're participating in the action of making decisions. Evidence itself, however, is insufficient for making the decision. The decision makers need to have options. And in the context of science diplomacy, diplomacy comes from options without advocacy, where the options can be used or ignored explicitly by the decision makers. The goal of this is to deliver informed decisions, not good decisions or bad decisions, right decisions or wrong decisions, but informed decisions, decisions that optimize the available information so that the decision makers 
can contribute in effective ways across a continuum of urgencies. This process, starting with questions, enables common interest building. Questions are the lowest hanging fruit. They, are, they exist before the various stakeholders have vested interests. Questions is an opportunity to frame dialogues. And in this context, I use this approach to convene the first formal dialogue between NATO and Russia, for example, two uh, adversaries, oil and, and, and water in that sense. But the pro starting point of questions enables a process of common interest building from research to action across the data evidence interface where individuals like ourselves, all of us on this call, can contribute as observers as well as participants. In the context of the types of decisions that are delivered, there are two general arenas. One arena of decision making involves governance mechanisms, laws, agreements, treaties, conventions and policies, as well as regulatory strategies, including insurance at diverse jurisdictional levels. During our pandemic period, where we have a common interest in survival at a global scale, local to global considerations of our, of our survival. We can see that these jurisdictional levels extend from subnational to national to international levels. At the same time, there are decisions associated with built infrastructure, fixed, mobile, and other assets, including communication, research, observing information, and other systems that require technology plus investment. The challenge that we face at local to global scales is one of coupling the governance mechanisms and the built infrastructure to achieve progress with sustainability, which operates across generations. So in the context of the South China Sea, of which I am not an expert, but delighted and honored to contribute to this dialogue, there is the challenge of common interest building across a continuum of urgencies, short-term to long-term, security to sustainability timescales, the elements of the natural ecosystem, the species in the system, as well as the uses of that system, as well as the geopolitics of the region. All of that is part of driving balance. And the challenge in this is to think beyond the moment, beyond the political, geopolitical context of superpowers and allies and adversaries. The challenge is to extend the dialogue to consider urgencies that operate also across generations and to look into the future in a way where the questions themselves can facilitate common interest building. So with this as opening remarks, it is an honor and a pleasure to contribute to this dialogue and I thank the East-West Center, as well as James Borton for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Berkman. Uh, that was really a wonderful scene setter and um, context for the issue of science diplomacy. We now have an opportunity to go to two uh, sessions uh, back to back. The first one focusing on South China Sea marine challenges, where we have three perspectives uh, from Dr. McManus, Dr. Hoy and Dr. Lugman, uh, uh, so I'm, uh, respectively based at the University of Miami uh, in Vietnam um, at the National University and at De La Salle University in the Philippines. So let us begin uh, with that uh, next session and uh, then we will uh, proceed from there to the second session. Please, Dr. McManus. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you a, a very short talk and um, if um, I start to run over, our other panelists will give me the, uh, the time signal. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I'm going to, first of all, let me show you this picture on the left here. This is a picture taken at the, uh, the very center of the South China Sea in the Northern Spratly Islands where the, um, the Philippine main base is. And because there's a Philippine base with Marines and, and they actually have a boat they can used to patrol, little rubber boat, um, this place is fairly protected and fairly healthy. Uh, it's overfished to an expert, but it's at least something, uh, something nice. So 
the, the coral reefs of the South China Sea are among the most diverse in the world. Um, for instance, we have about 600 species of coral uh, in the Philippines and 571 in, in this area. Um, the main areas for coral reefs uh, concerns are Dongsha Atoll, which is uh, claimed by Taiwan and China, um, and it used to be called Pratas, but there's no point in calling it an English name. Um, Paracels, uh, the uh, Scarborough, notice Scarborough is right near the Philippines. That's going to be quite significant. Mm -hmm. And um, Scarborough, okay. uh, uh, the Spratly Islands. Um, so these are what the reefs look like. And take a look at this first one. If you go to Google Earth, and I use Google Earth all the time, uh, Google Earth uh, shows several of the systems here. Uh, have this sort of dark shadow. What this is is a huge underwater atoll, and uh, the, the, the land was sinking and sea level was rising, and it, the relative sea level was growing too fast for the reef to accrete upwards. The, the reef sort of makes concrete, and that's what it grows. Uh, it makes concrete out of sand, and it grows uh, in a sense, but we call it accretion. And so these little places that could keep up became atolls and platform reefs by themselves. This is one of them uh, here. And uh, and some of them have islands like the Taiwanese base that um, Alan Chen brought me to. Thank you. Um, and this is Scarborough Reef, which is near the Philippines. Um, this again is a similar picture to the one that uh, Paul Berkman just showed you. Uh, just to remind you that there's a lot of overlapping claims. The red line shows uh, Taiwanese and Chinese claim, um, but um, the, e the potential exclusive economic zones are these blue things. This kite-shaped thing in the middle is open uh, uh, waters outside of exclusive economic zones, uh, which is going to complicate anything in the future. Um, and we have the, the islands scattered here. Uh, the green ones are supposed to be island bases, but there's actually um, more island bases. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a, a picture of uh, connectivity. In other words, uh, people have released particles in this uh, simulation and shown how far they go. And you can see that from the Spratlings, uh, particles go a long ways. And those, in one month, and that's that's um, representing larval fish. And the whole idea was this is just one pattern. We've seen patterns that go up here, patterns that go down to Indonesia. So because of the reversing uh, monsoons, this place is heavily mixed, and the larvae go all over the place. And that's what led to the idea for a uh, Spratly Island Peace Park uh, in the early 90s. Um, <clears throat> what's happening lately is you had these healthy reefs, like this is a uh, fire cross reef from 2009, and wonderful ecosystems all over here, except for a little uh, Chinese base on stilts. And um, here it is again, but this is the island was being chopped up to get giant clams uh, by uh, a group of people from Tanmen, Hainan, China. And this um, damage, uh, uh, it's very widespread across many islands. Uh, but then um, in seven places, China built those massive bases. So the bases, that's irreversible damage. Uh, a square kilometer is a million square meters, and there's 15 square, uh, 15 square kilometers of permanent damage. It can never be returned. Uh, and you know, 90% of that was those big bases that the that China was building. Uh, dredging can usually recover harbors and channels. Well, you'll just have deeper ecosystems. And 104 square kilometers have been damaged, uh, at least. This is all minimal uh, figures uh, by the giant clam chom chopper boats. Now, we thought that China had stopped this in 2016, but they uh, kept going a little bit. And they've come back to doing it in Scarborough Reef, uh, as well as the Paracels. And so this is a problem. However, if they stop, then the reef will recover uh, uh, mostly within about 20 years. Uh, if you don't tear up the bottom, these reefs 
tend to recover pretty well within 10 years. That's very important because some people are saying, oh, there's nothing worth saving. Um, that's nonsense. And by the way, this 162 square kilometers is about 3% of the shallow, um, uh, of the total reef area. But for the shallow reef, the ones that are actually keeping up with sea level, um, that's, that's about 9%. So when someone says, oh, there's nothing worth uh, protecting there, that's wrong. Actually, there's plenty. It's, it's more than 90% still healthy um, and um, certainly recoverable. Uh, however, there is overfishing uh, in, the, in the open waters and in um, the coral reef areas. Uh, in the case of, uh, uh, this is China um, with, they're nice boats going out, some of them subsidized by the military, so they can also be used as paramilitary forces. Uh, this is a, a large banca, a boat from the Philippines, uh, and it had little bancas on board that could go into the reef flats, so that's why we know they're uh, overfished. And these uh, shore side bancas, smaller ones uh, from the Philippines, are being towed right into the center of the South China Sea and um, they, we know that they flip quite often. And so people, we think people are dying, we don't have good figures, um, but um, people are literally dying to get out there and get fish. This is because there's hardly any fish left in, in the coastline. You, you, you look in a coral reef where you expect to get giant fish and you get fish typically about 10 centimeters long. And uh, I'm always concerned what happens when we run out of the 10 centimeter fish. Uh, six hours of fishing nowadays would get you a basket about this big of little fish. And that's, that's it on a coral reef. Um, summary, more than 90% of the coral reef is in good shape, um, but protection is urgently needed. Many fish stack stocks are near collapse and are shared among the climate countries. So the, the stock, in other words, you fish one end and they fish the other end and you're fishing the same group of fish, therefore uh, you have to coordinate what you're doing. It's like two people sipping from the same bowl of soup. You have to coordinate how much you're going to get. Otherwise, the one who grabs more is just gonna get your share. Uh, and the best mechanism for this coordination is a South China Sea Regional Fisheries Organization. We need a group of people who meet regularly. Right now, we have lots of workshops. It's, they're sporadic, they show up. Um, Dr. Lagman and uh, Dr. Chen and so forth are getting involved in these, but we need an organization that can actually meet regularly and exchange information and work towards other conservation means, such as getting more uh, protected areas. So I'll stop there. Wonderful. Please, uh, may I invite now from Vietnam, uh, Dr. Hoi, please, if you would make your seven minutes, uh, eight minutes of remarks, please. Um, I think the, uh, the uh, presentation of the Dr. John McManus is uh, very informative and uh, update uh, regarding to the environment and state situation and situation in the South China Sea, especially in the uh, Spratly Island regarding to the uh, Coral Reef reclamation for uh, man-made island. So uh, I think uh, uh, regarding to this uh, reclamation, so not only uh, coral reef destroy, but uh, also destroy some connectivity uh, of the economic and connectivity between the some species and uh, the also the food uh, from the Spratly Island and uh, the center of uh, South China Sea uh, to provide uh, on the uh, levy uh, food and uh, uh, the fisheries resources, not only for uh, uh, for Vietnam, so also the for our own uh, the country in the South China Sea. So it means uh, we have uh, some the common benefit uh, in the in this uh, uh, region. Uh, and uh, uh, requires the, the uh, connective uh, action between the Kaleman country in the South China Sea. Which I and Zone Marandot is uh, one of the uh, famous scientists to try uh, 
uh, to build the pit and uh, uh, restore uh, the current uh, ecological uh, condition in the South China Sea. I also follow him. Uh, regarding to the uh, solution, so uh, uh, recently I think the, the dispute uh, condu uh, management in San Jose is uh, still wrong and uh, uh, very, very difficult uh, to sit together to talk about the uh, even uh, scientific ocean, scientific cooperation and collaboration in between the, the Kremang country. Uh, so uh, in Vietnam, uh, my personality also try to some uh, uh, to parapet in the, some uh, regional forum about the South China Sea uh, possible solution to reduce the uh, tension in the South China Sea by the, by the science uh, and technology uh, possible cooperation in this region. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a lot of discussion. Uh, we have some uh, consensus, but uh, only in the paper. But uh, when the, we move to the uh, testing some the proposal, uh, so not not easy. So I think uh, neither the, 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 the John McManus uh, talk about uh, in Vietnam, in I found in the uh, year 2016, we need so the on the claimant in this region have to free the free the, uh, the, the, the 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 declaration of the uh, conflict, you know, conflict claim area in the South China Sea. We have to stop and to keep the status present status and uh, sit together to talk about first maybe the ocean science uh, cooperation and collaboration. So is it, uh, I think that maybe we have uh, some, uh, uh, even the IGIP and the zone members also uh, focus uh, some priority regarding to the marine protected area in this area because the, uh, the situation have a very high uh, conservation potential. So the each country in this region have a, uh, their uh, national system of the MPA, uh, but the need to share first, uh, share step by step of uh, to to promote the uh, scientific uh, cooperation uh, in this region. Uh, so I think uh, may be good. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor. Uh, uh, Dr. McManus also echoed the theme of the need for. Um, either regional bodies or for systematic, ongoing, sustained uh, discussion, information sharing and cooperation. So I thank you for uh, seconding that. Um, and I know that we have a session on science cooperation opportunities, tools and technologies in our second session. So we may uh, continue that theme further and get further uh, assessments. Uh, we turn now to Dr. Lagman from uh, De La Salle University in the Philippines. Professor, welcome, please. You have eight minutes. Good evening in the Philippines. I'm sharing my slides now. I am actually just giving you a summary of the things that are written in a, in a, a document that I can give you a, a copy of later. You see, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is maybe the single most important uh, regional policy instrument that has changed the face of fisheries in the region and again in the whole world. With this policy, we actually had an ability to call a certain part of our ocean our own, which brings with it the ability to put in more investments because of knowing that you will have a return on those investments. And just looking at the fisheries data on the marine fisheries production, South China Sea fishing states, you could see a very sharp increase in the catch value simply because of the investments that had gone during that time. But with the rights comes responsibilities. And Article 63.1 of that document says, where the same stocks or stocks of associated species occur within the exclusive economic zones of two or more coastal states, this state shall seek either directly or through appropriate subnational, sub-regional, regional organizations to agree 
upon the measures necessary to coordinate and ensure the conservation and development of such stocks without prejudice with the, uh, the other provisions of this part. If you look at the uh, list of top countries that are producing or are, have the highest marine capture fisheries production, countries like China, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and even Thailand, Myanmar, and Taiwan out here are in that really big top list. And that has not changed. But if you would look at culture as well and diets of the people in this region, you could see, you know, using as a gauge Australia, Brazil, Germany, UK, and the USA, just the amount or percentage of fish protein in our mm -hmm. diets would be almost three times that of our counterparts in the West. And therefore, fish plays a very big part in the, uh, in the diets and the importance of culture and livelihood in this region. Now we're talking about a region in the middle of common territory, apparently, which has all this information, 190 million people who live in the coastal area, 17 million tons of fish worth about $22 billion in value are landed annually. So it is just to show how important economically this region is. And aside from the use for fisheries, there is cargo, there is, um, you know, all the other kinds of uses that you have for this region. Uh, just to give a background of fisheries, if you look at the fish on the left, these are fish that you get from offshore or further from shore, and the fish on the right are those you will get closer to shore or where habitats exist. And if you look at the fishers who are actually catching this fish, those with the smaller boats and those that catch the nearshore fish are economically at a greater disadvantage, at least from the ownership of those resources, than those who are catching fish from offshore further from 15 kilometers uh, uh, nautical miles from the shoreline. So, you know, a fisheries policy is definitely structured across resources. Resources are structured across habitats. It is not true that the fish from offshore will just stay offshore and those inshore will stay inshore. But these habitats, which are very close to the shores, play a very big part in the production of the fish that people catch on both sides of that line. And you're talking about mangroves, seagrasses, coral reefs, and all other structures around that area. Of course, as you've seen from Dr. McManus's talk earlier, the central part of the South China Sea has a lot of these areas and habitats existing across it. Um, here are just some examples of habitats that have been, you know, rather pristine and beautiful in their uh, current conditions. The juvenile fish basically nurse in these habitats given the, um, the protection that they afford. Uh, I'm not so sure it is. Yeah, this is the first time I dove somewhere near Bolinao, Pangasinan, and this is when I came back to the Philippines. And you could practically see where the reef used to be in my second picture. So this is just like over 20 years from the time I first got my license and then coming back. And this is not, you know, uncop unprecedented in the habitat destruction we Dr. McManus was talking about. Looking at the profile of fisheries habitats across China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Taiwan, it basically just says that the shelf area would have high percentage of the coral reefs in the world, and they're with a lot of people that will actually cause destruction. And it's very hard to tell people that fish are, we're losing fish when you see this at ports, when you see this in the markets. It's very hard to explain that we are, are losing our fish. But what they don't understand is that overexploitation is actually changing the nature of the fish that's being caught. And Daniel Pauly and his team has basically emphasized how fishing down the food web and the change in the species is happening. These are my last two slides, and I'm basically going to talk about the differences in policies across different countries. If you could see Brunei Darussalam to Vietnam here, just the number of fishing, fishing zones differ, meaning the, the ability to go out and fish and what their policies are regarding who catches where 
varies between these countries. And if you would kind of think about the conflicting policies and the issues of closed seasons, we have been um, through a very tight spot with the Recto Bank incident and where Philippine vessels were rammed by Chinese vessels apparently. But it's, you know, can you just imagine being fishing, being told you cannot fish and somebody else is getting fish which you think is yours. I'm not, I'm not you know, saying somebody's right or wrong here, but this conflict in policies is what's causing these major difficulties around the area. And you're talking about poor fishers or you know, in, in the outskirts of the country. A study we did with Dr. McManus Allen and uh, many regional partners looked into the genetic structure of fish around this area. And what we basically found out was a kind of map that shows fish resources go around the circles and they basically are not defined by national boundaries or EEZs, but mainly one place is covered by many countries and many countries are responsible for the sum these places. This further emphasizes the need for that regional fisheries policies that doesn't necessarily have to be associated with ownership, sovereignty, and the implos. So just as a list of recommendations and this um, booklet, which we kind of wrote, I kind of wrote was in the, in the web, if you can find it. We're, we need an establishment of a wider scale transboundary fisheries management policy, which include the establishment of common uh, no take zones, as well as common uh, understanding of closed seasons and open seasons. This is, should not be so difficult, be that there are this existing regional, um, international instruments. But most of all, this could actually be an opportunity to, to redefine fisheries policy for the small scale fishers who are usually or identified as the main problems for habitat destruction. If you look at the differences, I saw a paper on the benefits and the destruction for fisheries between small fisheries and large scale fisheries, there really has to be a rethinking about all these policies. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lagman. That was uh, very useful as well. So we've had three terrific presentations that set out the nature of the problems, whether they be environmental on coral reefs, cooperation on fisheries, um, the nature of uh, the requirements for fish and protein stocks, et cetera. We now turn to panel two, which looks at the theme of science cooperation opportunities, tools, and technologies. And um, I forget exactly why, but this panel has seven minutes each rather than eight. Uh, and I'm not, uh, I, I think that was to make it uh, 90 minutes um, possible. But we have again a terrific uh, group of speakers Dr. Alan Chen from the Biodiversity Research Center, Taiwan, Dr. Lina Gong, Research Fellow at the Rajaratnam International Studies uh, uh, Institute in Singapore at RSIS NTU, and of course, uh, Dr. McManus, uh, who is a scientist with the GEF United Nations Environmental Program. Marine Plastics um, Program. So delighted. Would I? Would Dr. Chen please lead us off for seven minutes? Um, first, first of all, I would like to thank the East and West Center for this uh, invitation and uh, the opportunity to see um, a lot of very good old friends here. And uh, it's very uh, delight to listen to um, John and uh, and uh, and the Manchester talk about the importance of resources and the uh, coral reef in the, in the South China Sea. So I would like to continue to share my uh, experience to work in the region. Uh, since this uh, section is called Science Cooperation Opportunity and Tour and Technology. So, so um, I hope that my experience share here will be encourages um, the, um, the future generation uh, continue to this task to look into the region we are all care about. So I will more focus on the, the, the uh, coral reef inter interdependency and the conservation, particularly in the, in the, in the era of a changing climate. Next, please. Um, coral reef biodiversity is probably the, the highest in the, in the uh, ocean. So um, the coral reef uh, occupy less than three uh, the 300,000 kilometers per square and less than 2.2 percent of the area of the ocean, but it is, it is the home for 
a lot of species um, um, associated with coral reef. It has been estimated that over 100,000 uh, 100, known species um, described from the coral reef, but there's over millions, including those uh, unseen uh, microorganisms, uh, are still waiting for us to discover. And um, it's also um, the, the high diversity provide a very important uh, protein resources for uh, over um, uh, one billion of people who rely on the healthy coral reef, including those uh, um, islanders from Pacific and also from Indian Ocean and Caribbean. And it's very high productive um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the value. So it's been estimated nearly, or, uh, nearly um, 30 billion US dollars global net benefit. Uh, that provide by coral reefs, including uh, fishery and uh, tourists and etc. Next, please. Next one, please. Sarah, next one, please. I've moved it. Is it not showing up? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Next one. Yeah, I've, I've moved it. It's on the slide for fish species. Okay. But it's not moved. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, 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 the focal, the, 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 the focal topics of uh, today's uh, um, uh, presentation is on the South China Sea, also known as the West, West Philippine Sea or East Sea, yeah. depends on the country who is claiming about the, the sovereignty for this uh, uh, area. But uh, based on the uh, fish basis, the, it, it says that over, uh, over 3,000 and nearly 3,700 3, species of, of fish were recorded here. And in terms of the hardcore species, it's been uh, shown that over 571 species, which is just, it's more than uh, the, um, the, the, the coral triangle uh, regions uh, just next to the South China Sea. So this is the whole area provide a very important habitat as, a as, as just by a mensch and also uh, the John. Next please. But, um, but as the, the coral reef have been faced uh, four very um, important threats. First one is overfishing as we've seen uh, from from previous uh, um, speakers, also pollution um, um, and also habitat destruction um, um, through the region, and most most uh, serious was uh, was the the uh, synergetic effects caused by the climate changes, particularly for the increase in the seawater temperatures. Next, please. And uh, as uh, as we all also hear from this uh, webinar that. The coral reef is a very important protein provider to our human uh, um, uh, population. Next, and uh, but the the, the destructive uh, fishing impact, as we we uh, um, always seen in the region, already caused the, the big uh, uh, problem issue in terms of uh, protein provide um, um, uh, in the whole regions in the South China Sea. Next, please. Um, and uh, in terms of habitat, habitat destruction, particularly for during the last few years, the territory distribution and uh, uh, extinction of the giant clan, as uh, John just mentions, uh, in the region is a, is a very serious pro problem. The, there's a study already shown that the, discard, the, the increasing of the artificial island area will actually the, uh, in the reverse relationship with the decreasing of the coral reef uh, area. And John also published a paper in 2017 indicated the loss of the, um, of the land and also uh, loss of the, the coral reef due to the reclaim by removing the giant clam in the region, and mainly through the, the Chinese uh, fishermen in the South China Sea. Next, please. And, but all the effects um, will probably will be getting uh, worse due to the greenhouse gas emission, particularly for the carbon dioxide to the air and, uh, and uh, the, the heat actually went into the ocean. And the, the rising seawater temperature already caused the mass bleaching in the last few decades. And uh, the slide I show here is actually this ongoing process we have been observed 
in the Taiwanese coral reef um, um, in this year, uh, in this summer. And uh, we're expecting that it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the, severe, the, the most severe bleaching uh, in the history of the Taiwanese coral reef. And also um, the, the impact of climate change will intensify the disturbance, mainly through the Taiwan in the region over here. And this is all the expect that will be seen um, um, in the South China Sea. Next, please. <clears throat> And the, um, the IPCC already published several important um, uh, um, uh, reference book and report in the last few years, but particularly these two. One is the, the, the scenario called 1.5 global warming scenario. And the other is the one published in the last October about the ocean and across the field in the, the changing climate. So uh, the, all the scientific evidence already there suggests that coral reef probably, next please. The coral reef will be probably the, 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 the most uh, severe, next, the, the, the most severe um, um, uh, ecosystem in the region here. If you keep the busy as usual, we probably will lose the 99% of global coral reef, including the one in the South China Sea, um, which is very severe that um, we need to, to face this. And the greater attention and effort have to be put into conservation. But if we can actually decontrol the temperature uh, down to 1.5 degrees and high, we will be able to save the 10% to 30% of coral reef um, um, in, in a global scale. So the question is, this, this will be the one that in the South China be, be the selection one as the 10% the, 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 the to the 30%. Next, please. Therefore, there's a, there's a great science of cooperation opportunity in the, in the South China Sea in the changing nature. So I, what I would uh, suggest that uh, uh, there's a four major um, a cooperation uh, um, opportunities that will be should focus. One is the core interdependency and the resilient and the governmency um, uh, in the region. Uh, I think for the slide I show here, we have to really focus on the conservation and also um, the, um, the not continue to lose the, the coral reef in the region as we're showing here that, that uh, most of the reclaimed uh, island um, um, made by the China, China in the last uh, few years already caused the damage. But you can see that some island which is the, on the traditions of Taiwan, we still maintain in, 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 in a better shape, which provide a hope for, for the future. And also we need to continue to de develop cooperation to, to the research on the oceanic atmosphere and also biogeochemistry process in terms of uh, disturbance in the region here. The most important, we need to look into the social ecosystem and also food security in the region. We need to provide the, the region uh, uh, the, the, the better future. Uh, the last one I will call the attention that we, re we need to, uh, for the region to develop the core reef conservation strategies Papita under the 5.5 scenario uh, for the future of coral reef in the region here. Uh, last one. Thanks for your attention. I hope uh, one day we can also take this um, richest vessel to sail in the uh, uh, South China Sea and run our science project there. Thank you so much. Well, what a wonderful aspiration to take that science uh, diplomacy boat uh, through, yeah. the, through the area. Well, we will look forward to that opportunity. Let me turn to Dr. Uh, Dr. Lina Gong from RSIS Singapore, please. Greetings from Singapore. First of all, I would like to thank the East West uh, Center and Mr. Borton for having me. It is a great pleasure to join a panel of uh, distinguished scholars to discuss this very important topic for Southeast Asia. And my intervention today will be from the perspective of political science or security studies more specifically, a bit different from the rest of the panelists. Yes, science cooperation in the South China Sea, a non-traditional security perspective. In East Asia, the concept of non-traditional security or NTS has been frequently used since the beginning of the 21st century because of the 1997 Asian financial crisis and the SARS epidemic in 2003. NTS essentially refers to non-military problems that challenge the survival of the state and well-being of the people. Some of these problems include climate change, uh, natural hazards, 
environmental pollution, food shortage, and infectious disease. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown to all of us what an NTS crisis can cause for states and individuals. The cost of such an event is no less or even more than a military conflict. Marine environmental pollution is obviously one of the NTS concerns in the region under the rubric of environmental security. This issue receives increasing attention in ASEAN. This is evident in the adoption of the Bangkok Declaration on Combating Marine Debris in ASEAN Region in 2019. And national governments in the region have taken efforts too. The Philippine and Thai governments, for example, closed the popular uh, tourist islands for environmental concerns. Because many of these issues are transnational, it is beyond the ability of any single or individual state to deal with it in, uh, effectively. So management of these issues needs cooperation or joint efforts by the states concerned. And because of their non-military nature, they are considered um, less sensitive and therefore have been used as a channel for uh, maintaining dialogues and generate goodwill among countries. Japan and the US, for example, have been supporting ASEAN and its member states dealing with various NTS challenges, such as natural hazards. And China and ASEAN signed a joint declaration on NTS cooperation in 2002 and a few memorandum of understanding since 2004. So cooperation is an ideal and desirable way for dealing with NTS challenges. In, South, uh, in the South China Sea, there are certainly uh, cooperative activities, but it seems more should be done. In my view, the excessive emphasis on the state as the only security uh, reverent object is one of the many reasons that we don't have enough cooperation. So when we talk about security, it is very important to specify who or what we are protecting. So traditionally, it's the state, which has sovereignty, territorial integrity, population. So it is from this angle that we are seeing the com competing claims in the South China Sea, and which have uh, heightened tensions among the states concerned. Because territorial integrity is so important, the national governments are unlikely to alter their position. And as a result, it is very difficult to substantiate or deepen cooperation in this um, body of water. So from a non-traditional security perspective, the security reverent object also include the people. As the population increases, living standards rise, states are under pressure to sustain growth to meet the growing demands of its population for food, water, energy, and other resources. But because of the limited nature of many of these resources, so we have seen the depletion of resources and competition among states. And because of um, unsustainable economic activities such as IUU, excessive tourism, discharge of untreated uh, waste into the seas, this um, environmental issues are getting more serious. So in the context of South China Sea, we have seen reports of fishing disputes among the littoral states, and such incidents are a source of tensions too. So when the traditional concern entangles with the non-traditional ones, the situation becomes even more complicated and concerning. So in my view, environmental security differs from other types of NTS in a way that the environment itself can be a security reverent object too. But this is largely missing from our discussions, particularly those focusing on South China Sea. And we need to consider whether it is legitimate or justifiable to defend sovereignty, to meet human needs at the expense of the marine environment, including the sea creatures. So what kind of relationship between the different security reverend objects is healthy or sustainable? 
Another practical way is to initiate or strengthen cooperation in issues indirectly related to the environmental um, status in the South China Sea, like education. So joint education programs between littoral states of the South China Sea or under ASEAN on marine science subjects can be one option or um, possible ways for further cooperation or cooperation in waste management in ASEAN member states. As much of marine plastic debris is actually from land-based sources and a lack of waste management facilities is an important cause for that. So given the growing interest in ASEAN member states to curb plastic pollution in the seas, joint research in this area is also a possible pathway to the future. So there are many barriers to cooperation in this body of water. To cope with um, or circumvent those barriers, the state may consider first, how they view the relationship between the state, people and the environment. And second, start cooperation in the less controversial areas to build confidence. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Gong sort of selfishly as a political scientist myself at some previous point in my life, very good to have a political science view on science diplomacy, as well as scientists view of how we might approach diplomacy. So uh, I think uh, having those, uh, the nexus of those two views is very useful indeed. So thank you so much. Uh, our last speaker in this session is uh, Dr. Liana McManus, as I said. Uh, Dr. McManus, please. Thank you, Satu. A good day to all, and it's an honor to participate in this webinar. I'd like to share a few thoughts on how science may play a role in sustaining the South China Sea. Next slide. According to Dr. Jane Lubchenco, a former head of the national, U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, we are supposed to have a new social contract for science because the world is changing very profoundly. Scientists need to lead the dialogue on scientific priorities, new institutional arrangements, and improved mechanisms to disseminate and utilize knowledge more quickly. Next slide. In this changing world, 193 nations have voiced their aspirations that they wish to pursue for their well being and that of the planet. These are the 17 sustainable development goals that make up the sustainable development agenda to 2030. Next slide. In particular, I'd like to point you to sustainable development goal number 14, which is about preserving life in the oceans. It includes preventing and reducing marine pollution, conserving ecosystems such as coral reefs, mangroves and seagrasses, managing fish harvest, and conserving at least 10% of coastal and marine areas. Next slide. A global assessment of transboundary large marine ecosystems, or LMEs for short, worldwide, showed that Southeast Asia have their LMEs. It has five LMEs. These LMEs on average are at high risk, the orange uh, color, which is level four on a scale of one to five from low to highest risk. But what does high risk mean? Next slide. How does the South China Sea stack up against the aspirational goals? On the issue of pollution, nutrients and plastics are increasing and disrupting marine food chains. On marine protected areas, the South China Sea is two thirds away from the minimum goal of 10% by area. On overfishing, around 40% of fish stocks are collapsed or overexploited. Next slide. Addressing goal 14 for the oceans is linked with other goals. But how do we eradicate poverty among 38 million poor around the South China Sea, mostly fishing and farming families and urban dwellers? How do we eradicate hunger 
knowing that 30% on average of animal protein is supplied by dwindling fish stocks. Next slide. Given the environmental, economic, social, and political state of the South China Sea, what must scientists do? Next slide. When I went back to the Philippines in 1986 with John, there were more projects than graduate faculty. In the, in the 80s, ASEAN cooperative programs in marine science were on hyperdrive. I participated in three that I show here. ASEAN Canada focused on marine pollution and red tides. ASEAN Australia on systematic assessments of coastal ecosystems. And for ASEAN US, it introduced the approach called integrated coastal zone management. These projects I call foundational and their legacies shape marine science in the region to this day. The years following was a period of institution and coalition building. The projects included implementing action programs and plans at regional, national and subnational scales. Confidence building measures focused on multilateral or bilateral platforms were taken, notwithstanding conflicts in jurisdictional claims. Given this rich scientific experience, what must scientists do to sustain the South China Sea? The revised social contract under the Sustainable Development Agenda compels scientists to drive transformations on how we relate with one another so we can collectively protect and use the bounty of the South China Sea large marine ecosystem. Four things we need to do. One, we must show that linked ecosystems from land to sea constitute our collective principle in a changing and constraining climate. We must show how this principle must be managed to last generations, building scenarios and communicating options for viable actions. Number two, we must show that ecosystem health equates to human well being. Degrading ecosystems is eroding the principle, and it incurs very high costs for, will, for human well being. This cost must be quantified and integrated in governance. Number three, human consumption of air, water, land, and sea must be underpinned by the rates at which ecosystems replenish. What happens under scenarios of optimal or excessive consumption, we need to quantify and communicate. Finally, the asymmetry among nations can no longer be an excuse for unilateral actions. Only par partnerships based on mutual and reciprocal trust and respect can safeguard the principle. We must all work hard and fast to nurture resilience in these partnerships, despite tensions and disagreements. Last slide. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. McManus, uh, for a very eloquent and uh, well thought out um, uh, presentation on, on why we need to cooperate. And particularly, I was taken, I wasn't aware of the previous generation of joint projects. And so immediately it came to my thought uh, how we might be able to um, rebuild some of those projects. Uh, of course, different times, different conditions, different environments, different needs. But in any case, um, the general principle of um, projects that build uh, a regional human development capacity, as well as a scientific baseline uh, in a cooperative spirit, uh, which is the theme of this science diplomacy initiative. I want to thank all of you for being remarkably uh, well disciplined on time. I'm, um, I'm not sure whether that is explained by your scientific backgrounds 
or or a combination of uh, your training, but I thank you because it's always tricky to do a program for 90 minutes on a webinar with so many distinguished speakers with so much to say. So thank you. Uh, very few technical glitches, and it's now my pleasure to turn over the proceedings uh, to my colleague and collaborator who uh, brought this uh, program, as I mentioned at the outset, to our attention, and that's uh, Mr. James Borton. Uh, James, will you please take over the Q&A, and I see that some uh, questions have already been placed in the uh, queue. So over to you, James, and I will turn off my mic. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the East-West Center again, and of course our distinguished panelists for their major contribution for today's webinar. I think all of us would have to agree with what our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Paul Berkman, stated uh, in starting this program. He said, science diplomacy is the language of hope for humanity. And so we've moved to our, our panelists, our scientists, who have really presented kind of a clarion call for science to lead policy uh, in addressing these stark environmental issues in the South China Sea. Uh, all of you have addressed the uh, climate change issues, the ocean acidification of uh, the pollution from plastics, the overfishing in the South China Sea, and of course, uh, sadly, the coral reef destruction. I think in opening this up, um, we're really focusing on about three key words, uh, collective action, conservation, and the protection of our ecosystems. All of this is a part of the food security issue which is looming in the South China Sea. And so in terms of opening this uh, kind of questions up uh, to the panelists, I wanted to frame uh, some kind of meta questions specifically. James, James, before you do, sorry, I please, please forgive me uh, for interrupting. It's only because we do not see you on the video and wondered if there might be a problem on your video end. Please proceed, but uh, I just point that out because you may not have known that. So no, I'm, I'm. Uh, thank you very much. It, okay, it's, uh, we'd like to see you. That's my bottom line. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I can see myself in the corner, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, I don't know what the problem is, but uh, again, the technological glitch has okay. happened here. Uh, what I'd like to do is frame uh, a few uh, general questions for all panelists rather than singling them out. And the first one is we're calling for this need for cooperation among the claimant nations to uh, address the science that is necessary. And so how do we convince claimant nations in the South China Sea to establish innovative ways to share their science data, to map out a blueprint for environmental conservation and a sustainability plan? The idea is that we want to have these scientists from all of the nations share their data and how relevant that is for creating a kind of collective plan that will benefit all of those countries in the commons. So what measurable steps can we take to create that kind of, uh, of regional unity in the sharing of science data? And uh, any of our panelists can address that and, and I welcome their responses. There is already experience in scientific data sharing uh, back with the ASEAN Australia uh, project, they established a reef monitoring uh, system region-wide, and the data is shared through a database. Uh, albeit there may be levels of protection of the data, but by far they have adopted a policy of open data. Very good. Is there anyone else that would like to? Uh... Yeah, I'll jump into this. Um, your question of innovative ways and blueprint commons and regional unity. Um, the notion of claimant states, in a sense, uh, capacity is identified through the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So the overriding geopolitical context um, in terms of legal framework is the Law of the Sea Convention. Within the, within the 
South China Sea, as, as was shown by, by John McManus, uh, there was exclusive economic zones. Um, and the claimant states have exclusive economic zones. Beyond exclusive economic zones, presumably, is high seas. And in the context of the South China Sea, as well as in the Arctic, where I work predominantly, in a sense, the high seas is an area that's explicitly under international law beyond sovereign jurisdictions. And so the high seas lends itself to thinking in terms of ways that build common interests. In a sense, the high, the high seas is a, the international community looking outward from their common interests as opposed to the exclusive economic zones and claimant territorial seas looking inward in terms of their national interests. And so if you look at the region as a whole, in a sense, just like the earth, the region itself has areas that are explicitly under international law, beyond sovereign jurisdictions and within sovereign jurisdictions. And seeking that balance may help to create the type of blueprint that you anticipate. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Berkman. Um, the other the other question I had was, is the establishment of what I call public-private uh, multilateral partnerships in the, the South China Sea Marine Science Surveys uh, to measure and monitor the status specifically of coral reef uh, health? Uh, I, I don't know where, where we are in terms of those kind of uh, private uh, uh, Private public multilateral partnerships. So maybe someone would like to address uh, that. Well, I, I can just say I'm I'm picturing a private uh, group getting involved here, and um, there is actually a record of a group um, hiring a yacht from um, Singapore. This is many years ago, uh, and when they got into this scrap, they um, uh vietnam sank them so <laughs> there there is no private um uh operation going through here other than um uh, perhaps some of the corporations involved with the drilling uh, in collaboration with um uh, various countries so it's it's not really a private public private thing uh, but there is a the, 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 as, as Paul was, I wanted to mention that Paul was talking about the EEZs, and I, I showed the same picture that shows the EEZs. That's just on paper. <laughs> In reality, people can hardly get out there uh, into their own EEZs because the Chinese claim goes very close to the coastlines uh, throughout the area, and China clearly heavily dominates the area. Uh, most countries, with the exception of of Taiwan, fortunately, but most countries are concerned about putting any boats in the water, uh, especially official boats, uh, out of concern that they'll be rammed or, um, you know, <laughs> so, so uh, that, that's, that's the reality now. And when I went to um, the Philippine base in 2016, um, I know that that had been, uh, there is actually a marine lab had been set up there by the University of the Philippines. Uh, I found out later that the University of the Philippines hadn't been there since the year 2000 because of this problem. So it, it, in addition to all of this, we have the problem that it's, as, as Paul knows, it, and Lena, I'm sure, uh, you cannot um, legally do research in another country without permission from that country. But And asking for permission is an act of uh, recognizing someone else's sovereignty, so nobody wants to ask permission. That does not keep us from sharing the boats, as Alan was pointing out, and that James's uh, picture shows. Um, you know, there's there's no reason why uh, uh, in these expeditions that China is doing and, and uh, Taiwan and all the countries have uh, that they don't uh, invite the other people, and that's actually um, something that happened a bit with the uh, Philippine um, Vietnamese uh, cruises in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s. And actually, Liana was on one. China wouldn't allow me on there because I'm you know, clearly an American. 
but um, Liana got on board and she actually cruised, and I think uh, Two Hardy was on one. Very good. Thank you, uh, John. I'm now beginning to pick up a couple of questions, uh, and I'd like to share them uh, with all the panelists. Uh, this is a question from uh, Drake Long from Radio Free Asia, and uh, his question is, for the first set of panelists, or whoever would like to take it, China's distant water fishing fleet and the survey fleet in the South China Sea is ubiquitous, and as mentioned, tends to be tied into its foreign policy or armed forces in that area. Is there any indication that China would be sincere about creating and participating uh, in a regional uh, fishery management organization in the South China Sea? Go ahead, go ahead John. Yeah, this is something I deal with all the time. <laughs> um, th there's, there's this thing that um, China only deals bilaterally. And that does come up when they talk about um, oil exploration, uh, especially in the Philippines and so forth. So I, I looked around and it turns out that China is part of 17 or more, uh, as of 2011, um, land environment transboundary uh, agreements. In other words, uh, they want to protect the environment. And, and one of those involves four countries. So they, they have a history of doing multilateral um, uh, agreements as well. Uh, China is involved in several um, international fishery organizations. So it's not um, out of the picture that China could do this. It's just that, um, you know, with any country, it kind of depends on who you talk to and and who happens to be making the decisions. But I, I do think it is possible. Uh, China does have um, their ships all over. Um, and, uh, but the scientists uh, are, are all, you know, all the scientists across Southeast Asia and China tend to agree. They're, they're very distressed about the damage to the coral reefs. They're worried about the fisheries collapsing. We don't have enough sharing of the data to know for sure what the status of some of these things are, and certainly not enough to uh, monitor uh, so that you protect the stocks. So all the scientists know this as well. There's lots and lots of conservationists in China, and, and they tend to be very brave individuals, you know, because, you know, sometimes uh, you have to be careful what you say. So um, th there is a lot of hope, and we have to keep getting this out there. But we must fight this with the party line, which is everyone knows since uh, that, that uh, the South China Sea has belonged to China since time immemorial. That's an official line you get from, I'm sure Lena's heard this, <laughs> from uh, political scientists, uh, representatives of China. We have to fight that. We have to get the average person in China to realize that's wrong. And, and it's difficult. Uh, even, I show a picture with Taiwan is a separate country, and some people from China, including some students here, they, they see that and they, why? That's not a separate country. And yet it is, obviously, as Alan would be happy to tell you. <laughs> so, so we have to get inside China the, the information that gets out of this, um, this myth. Yeah, there's some other myths, like uh, uh, many people believe that because an island, it, or even rock, I mean, even something that's actually an old coral head, a rock, um, that it belongs to you if it's in your EEZ. And that's rampant in the Philippines and Vietnam. This is wrong. Just because it's in your EEZ does not make it yours if it's a thing above high, high tide. And so we have to get, kill these, kill these myths. Thank you. Thank you. John. In fact, uh, to add to that, I have learned that, uh, as you said, several Chinese marine scientists have been participating uh, in some of these regional workshops, and I believe that uh, a few of you may have been in attendance at them. And there is increasing number of marine uh, scientists from China who are interested in uh, science cooperation. Um, and again, as you said, those are brave individuals. I've just received a, another uh, question here, and I'm going to read this. Uh, science diplomacy may get stymied by geopolitical problems, uh, just as we were alluding to, as is happening today in the region. 
but can it not be representative and inclusive in nature at the subnational levels in this region in terms of knowledge creation, ownership, resource uh, management? There may be a tendency to depoliticize the debate at times uh, to secure solutions that may leave out many and lead to further conflicts. What are your uh, views about that uh, for any of the uh, panelists? Thank you. Um, I'll jump into that. Uh, geopolitical stymieing science diplomacy. This is the problem. Um, it is short-term thinking. Um, at the short time scale of geopolitical dynamics, unless you're a superpower or have access to resources at a global scale, we're all at a disadvantage. However, the, the, the level playing field happens over time. And the further you look into the future, the more equitable the discussion becomes. And the reality is that the children and young adults that are alive today will be alive in the 22nd century. So when we talk about across generations, it's not fanciful. It's across the 21st century. And to a significant extent, you know, there is opportunity to turn the dynamic of the discussion in which China itself has opened the door, which is thinking across the 21st century with the One Belt, One Road initiative. And so in a sense, operating at a geopolitical timescale is a disadvantage. And the, the, the reality is that we have the opportunity to think across generations. We have tools like the Sustainable Development Goals, which think at local to global scales across generations. And so I would, I would note in terms of the stymie, it's only because it's short-term thinking. And short-term thinking is paralysis. It, it leads to the gloom and the doom and the nationalism that we face on a regular basis. Um, just as in a following up just briefly, and then I'll, you know, I'll stop, James, the, the comments that, that, that John was making a moment ago about China and bilateral and, and multilateral, there may be an analogy to explore in the South South China Sea, and that, that is the Arctic. Um, I hadn't thought of it until this discussion, but the Arctic states, they all have sovereign interests, and they all have exclusive economic zones, and in the central of the Arctic is the high seas, the central Arctic Ocean high seas. There is a fisheries agreement, the Central Arctic Ocean High Seas Fisheries Agreement, which has as a basis a precautionary approach. It may be helpful to think of something analogous to a Central Arctic or Central South China High Seas Fisheries Agreement, where the participants are not uh, limited in terms of their presence and capacity within exclusive economic zones, but operate under international law in an area that is clearly beyond sovereign jurisdiction. So I just introduced that as a potential way of framing questions that may help to diffuse and open doors for dialogues that are otherwise complicated. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. In fact, uh, it seems to me that the uh, Arctic Council might serve as a, a model for the realization of a South China Sea Marine Science Council. Uh, and perhaps uh, some of our other panelists would like to even talk about what their experience uh, has been in the formulation of this uh, uh, kind of Marine Science Council uh, and how that might be uh, effectively uh, ramped up uh, as, we, uh, as we approach as we approach this ecological crisis uh, in the South China Sea. Any of our panelists? Uh, James, I just want to put in a short um, interjection, putting together what you were saying earlier about private partner, uh, partnerships sure. and this discussion on long-term timelines as opposed to generation, you know, generational timelines. I have lived long enough to be having seen the start of this discussion when I was still working with John as an early graduate student. And I'm now a professor in the university. And I kind of think what has been said has have been said and what needs to be done is already been articulated so many times again and I will be here even another 10 more years I guess and um, unless people can find an interest to sustain initiatives 
outside of you know the, the writing of grants and the getting of money from outside and that would either come from private partnerships or national governments to be able to sustain the initiatives that will keep the scientific cooperation going and the other thing is to find creative ways to really i think when benefits are being talked about when you're talking about um scaling up small things that we do with initial prime, you know prime funding that would then require the buy-in and resources that is not in the traditional pipelines we have right now. So yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it's, it seems that we're right on schedule here in terms of uh, looking at our clock and approaching 90 minutes. Um, I want to just take a, a moment to reflect uh, on the comments uh, that have been presented by you, the distinguished panelists. I want to thank again the East West Center uh, for your generous support and participation in this program. Uh, I think as Dr. Berkman just uh, highlighted, perhaps indeed we can take the conversations from this webinar and indeed continue them. Um, I am just delighted that we were able to assemble all of you in these di from different time zones. Uh, and I, I just, uh, Generously thank you for your uh, participation and welcome uh, a follow-up um, uh, to our conversation. Uh, and perhaps even the East-West Center, we might have part two of this uh, uh, program uh, down the road. So uh, that's, that's it for me. I don't know if uh, anyone else would like to, uh, to make any remarks, but I think we're ready to, to uh, say well, to those of you in Asia, I would have to say good night to you. It is late there. Uh, and uh, thank you again. James, can I just say from the East West Center's perspective, our mission is, is designed by the Congress is our mandate is to bring Americans and Asians together on issues of common concern, uh, common challenge, common opportunity. And so I can't think of a topic and a group of folks representing not every country in the region or every issue in the region, but certainly an important element uh, set of issues together. And I thank you, James, for, for uh, uh, collaborating with us on this. And I thank all of the participants who spoke today, but also all of you online. Uh, almost 150 signed up. We had, I think at one point, about close to 90, if I observed correctly, uh, joining us at all kinds of times from all kinds of places. So. Thank you all, be safe, be healthy, be happy, and we look forward uh, to continued engagement and to meeting our mission. Thank you so much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you all, stay healthy.